The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome to the Women in Depth podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Fiato. Join me as we explore the inner lives of women, their struggles, fears, hopes, and dreams. We'll go beneath the surface and take a deeper look at what is hidden, unknown, uncertain, and uncomfortable. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, Carmen and I are back to continue our series on complex trauma and highly sensitive persons. And today we're going to be discussing an experience that many HSPs with complex trauma experience, and this is the experience of dissociation. My name is Lourdes Fiato, and I am a psychotherapist in private practice in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I work with anxious and overwhelmed, highly sensitive women. And I'm Carmen Schmidt-Benedetti. I'm a psychotherapist in Sonoma County, California, and I work with highly sensitive women who have complex trauma. And so today we're very excited to talk to you about this topic because we both see this in the individuals that we work with, and there are a lot of questions about dissociation and exactly what it is. So before we get started, I just wanted to express that sometimes when we're talking about trauma and things related to trauma, we can actually become activated. Another word is triggered or sometimes checking out, which is very interesting because today we are going to be talking about dissociation, which is a form of checking out. And so just wanted to ask you to be gentle with yourself, be mindful of what you're noticing about how you're feeling in your body, what you're feeling as far as emotions, any thoughts that you're having. And if you're noticing that you're starting to disconnect or you're starting to feel overwhelmed or any other distress, uncomfortable emotions, go ahead and hit pause. (laughs) take some time and come back to this when you're ready. Also, if there's a possibility that you might find yourself activated by what we're talking about today, while you're listening, do something grounding, maybe go outside, listen to this in segments. You don't have to listen to the whole episode at one time. Listen with a friend, but there are a lot of things that you can do to ensure that as you're listening to this conversation, that you're also taking care of what you need emotionally, physically, and mentally. We're going to start today. We're going to jump right in, and we're going to be talking about this experience of dissociation. And oftentimes there's a lot of fear, misinformation, anxiety around what it is. So with every episode, I like to start with kind of the building blocks so that we all know exactly what it is that we're talking about. So Carmen, can you talk to us about what exactly is dissociation? Yeah. Oftentimes I use the term like checking out (laughs) when referencing dissociation. And there is a lot of misinformation or maybe a better way of saying is misunderstanding around what this is. And it can be kind of confusing to to understand and often can be difficult to define. Even within the trauma or therapy community, there can be discrepancies or disagreements about how to define it. Mm -hmm. One definition that I like comes from Kathleen Martin, who does a lot with structural dissociation. And she defines it as the inability to stay present with affect or your emotions. Another way I describe it often is just disconnecting from yourself or from your environment. So you're separating or distancing yourself from your experience because it's difficult to tolerate. So Carmen, why do we dissociate? Like, why does it happen? Dissociation is an adaptive process. It's often needed at a time to be able to cope with something. So it's the brain and body's way of protecting you from something that seems too difficult to tolerate, which could be either emotionally or physically, at least when it comes to trauma. So even, interestingly, positive emotions, you know, in using that 
definition from before of the inability to stay present with your emotions, even positive emotions can cause someone to disconnect. It can feel uncomfortable or they don't know what to do with it. So an example of that would be someone having trouble feeling calm because it doesn't feel safe for them to feel calm since they might miss danger if they're not on guard. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Especially if this is someone who has experienced trauma in childhood, it can become almost like this the state of being, right? To just be in a state of being on guard or another word we have for that is hypervigilance. Yes, exactly. So it is basically, again, your brain and body's way of trying to find a way to keep you safe from some kind of perceived danger. And I say perceived because... The danger might not actually be there, but because of how your nervous system might be wired or past experiences that you've had, there might be some kind of perception. Your brain might, and body might be getting a cue that something might not be safe or it's not safe to stay present with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It totally makes sense. I'm really glad you emphasized the perceived danger. It made me think about sometimes... When I'm working with clients, they might have a, they might become really angry or upset with, you know, their significant other because the significant other responded in a certain way. And there's a really strong reaction to that. But after looking at that interaction more closely, often we discover that the perceived danger wasn't about what the partner said, but it was a reaction to an actual danger that happened when the individual was a teenager or a child. And this interaction had a similarity to that, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, it's really a way to cope. So especially if someone doesn't have an alternative or they haven't given, been given other options, so maybe they can't escape the situation or maybe they haven't been taught or learned other ways to deal with difficult emotional experiences. Yeah, it reminds me of Pete Walker, who wrote a really amazing book on complex trauma, which we will put um, that in the show notes. He described that people who have experienced complex trauma have like a trauma type. And I've noticed that often that trauma type involves freezing or shutting down, um, so you can have a trauma type. It can be fight, you know, freeze, flee. He also includes fawn, which is a way of compromising or trying to appease. And I noticed that with a lot of individuals who've gone through trauma, because as children, you really don't have a lot of options. Dissociation, which is leaving or protecting yourself without actually leaving, is often one of the only options they have. Yeah, they have to exit the situation, so to say, in their mind or in their body or from the checkout of the, the circumstance or from themselves. Yeah. When you were mentioning the positive emotions and even needing to protect you know, yourself from those, it reminded me, Carmen, of my wedding, <laughs> my wedding day. And it was so stressful for me because there was so much feeling, even though it was good feeling, and I remember, you know, in certain parts of like the wedding ceremony and walking down the aisle, I was really having a hard time staying there. Mm -hmm. I almost felt like I was not in my body <laughs> because mm -hmm. just there was too much attention on me and too much focus and too much feeling. And it was just too much. You had to distance yourself a bit from it because it was I did. so overwhelming. Yes. And it was a positive experience. And that's that way you were sort of protecting yourself, right? You're like, this is too much. I've got to get some distance. Yeah. Yeah. And it just it's just very interesting how that can happen with anything that's overwhelming or intense, mm -hmm. which I think, again, is very, you know, it's important, especially for those who are highly sensitive to be aware of because it's not just perceived danger or a lot of anxiety or stress, it can be something very positive that you actually want. Mm -hmm. When you were talking, I was also thinking about something that I, I like to, to share with my clients so they can kind of understand what's happening in their brain when they check out. And 
when the amygdala perceives danger, and again, I'm so glad you're using the word perceives, you know, it can only do a few things. And these things are what, you know, we, we all are all aware of as the, the fight or flight response, but we also add in freeze and fawn. And what's interesting is when our amygdala gets to this space where it's perceiving danger, you know, our cortex, the thinking center, it shuts down. So we're not able to remember our tools. <laughs> we're not able to think of other perspectives. We're, we actually even have a hard time thinking at all. I've noticed sometimes with myself or with clients having difficulty forming a thought or what you're saying, you can't get what you're thinking to be what you're saying. It's really hard to connect and to be clear. And with the connection piece too, is when our amygdala is perceiving danger, another part of our brain, we call it the limbic center of the brain or the limbic system, which has to do with our ability to feel. It's a feeling center and also our ability to, to relate or connect. And so oftentimes when we are in this state, even if someone is trying to comfort us or nurture us, we're not able to respond to it. And we're also very disconnected from any other feelings besides fear and this need to protect ourselves. So Carmen, we talked a little bit about some examples of where we might feel the need to protect ourselves. And there's this response of wanting to disconnect. Are there any other examples or circumstances or situations where someone might experience dissociation? Well, one thing I think is really important to emphasize about this is that it, it happens on a continuum, right? So we all, regardless of if we have trauma or not, we all do it to some extent. So one common example that I think a lot of people can relate to is what's sometimes called highway hypnosis, where <laughs> you're driving from point A to point B and you get to point B and you're like, I don't really remember much of that <laughs> drive. Like maybe it's your typical route home or you're just kind of going through the motions, but maybe you're lost in thought. And then you get there and you're like, huh, I stopped at the stoplights and I did all of these things, but I don't fully remember. Like you weren't totally present as you were doing that. But yeah. at the same time, you were still able to operate the car and it wasn't that you were not safe. It was just you were so caught up in your thoughts or something that you were going through the motions, right? Another really common example is like when we zone out watching like a TV show or we're absorbed in a book or a conversation, we are really tuned into that thing. And maybe we're not very present with the rest of our environment or with ourselves, right? We're really engrossed. So that's on one end of the, on that continuum, right? Where is common experience. And then in terms of maybe how that shows up for HSPs, because I think that that's still on the continuum, but maybe it shows up a little bit differently. And where that might happen is like what you were talking about with your wedding, where there's some sort of overstimulation or overwhelm or emotional intensity that HSPs tend to have, right? That happens more easily for our finely tuned nervous system. And so this is a tool that they might develop, so to say, as to manage their overstimulation or overwhelm or that emotional intensity especially if they haven't been given other tools. You know, I think a lot of HSPs grow up in environments where maybe their families don't really know how to help them manage their um, overstimulation or overwhelm. And so a, someone's got to learn how to figure out how to do that. And so one way is, okay, let me disconnect from whatever is overstimulating or from whatever I'm feeling in my body. And that's a way to adapt to those kinds of experiences. And then in other circumstances, and we were referencing this before, with trauma or complex trauma, a person might feel that they have to check out during something that they're experiencing that is traumatic. Again, that perceived danger or they don't feel safe. One example might be where someone is being abused in some way. And that is very, again, inability to tolerate. So it's too difficult to tolerate whatever that is. And so in terms of like disconnecting from body, how that might look or feel is they might feel like they're outside of themselves or they don't feel very grounded. 
some people might describe like looking at themselves from above. And this is sort of on the more towards the other end of the continuum, as opposed to just the zoning out. So if, again, if someone has no other way to cope or manage with something that's difficult, they're going to find a way to do that. It's protective. It's adaptive to their circumstances. It's a defensive response. But what happens is that when they do that early on in their life or during a traumatic experience, that is one way they learn to cope. But if they don't learn other ways, they continue to do what they know. And they have some sort of need to take care of themselves. And so this is one way. In some circumstances, people completely blank out during a traumatic experience or ongoing traumatic experiences. That's why people might be missing time from their childhood. They're like, I don't remember very much of my childhood. Or they have blanks in time because they aren't fully present with the circumstances or with themselves in those moments. And it is an automatic survival response. So as you were describing, something happens later, for example, with someone's partner. They might check out and then they lash out at their partner or however they respond And they don't remember what they've done or how they've reacted because they revert back to that coping mechanism that they learned early on as a way to deal with trauma. And their body and brain starts telling them that that's going on again because it's getting some kind of information that that is occurring. Either, you know, that's the their partner is raising their voice or they give them a certain look or there can be a whole host of things that might be a cue to the brain or body that that thing that happened in the past is happening again. It feels like too much, essentially, for the brain or body, and it finds a way to adapt to those circumstances, which might be, let's not remember this. It's too difficult. Let's disconnect from this experience. Sometimes people describe it as, you know, if they're disconnecting from their environment, like it's sort of foggy or hazy or they can't, going back to what you were saying with that amygdala, they can't think very clearly. So I think one of the challenges with understanding and coping with dissociation is sometimes being able to tell if what I'm feeling or, you know, whatever, if the, the, what the client is feeling, is this just me being very overstimulated and stressed out and anxious or is it dissociation? You know, how do I know what it is? And I think one of the ways that it's helpful is by actually, and a lot of times when we dissociate, we have to look at this in retrospect because it is a protective response. It's the amygdala stepping in because it perceives danger. And so it's often very hard to do anything in the moment. But what I've found is helpful in understanding this experience is afterwards. If you can go back to whatever was happening when you started to check out and then looking at that experience. So, for example, if someone dissociates and it happens during a fight with her partner. So then later we go back and what was that fight about? And not specifically the words like we were fighting about. Did you buy the tickets to this or is your, you know, our in-laws coming over? No, it's not really about the specific content. But what happened in that moment? And maybe in that moment, the person who disassociated perceived that their partner was not listening to them, was not hearing them. And understanding when in your life were you not listened to or were you not heard? When do you remember this happening for the first time? And typically with my clients, it goes back to, I don't know, it's always been that way. Or I can remember when I was four or five or six and, you know, this happened and nobody asked me or noticed how I was feeling or considered how I was affected. So it was in the past a trauma of not being heard or considered or seen. And this happened repeatedly. And so the brain perceives that when you're not considered, heard or seen by your family member who is the source of this trauma, The brain, the hippocampus, the memory center of the brain, remembers this as this is a dangerous situation. We're going to flag this and keep it where we can refer to it in in the future so we can keep you safe. And then that develops into this response of where this child now, she continues 
growing up that whenever she is in a situation where she is being disregarded, her thoughts, her feelings, her needs, her wants, the hippocampus, the memory center signals to the amygdala, hey, this is dangerous. When she's not being heard or seen, she's in danger. And then that becomes this very good coping response that just gets quicker and faster. And so by the time this person grows up, her amygdala just does this at the hint that she's not being heard. And so at that moment, she can be overwhelmed by that. But this happens so quickly, and it's a lot of it's unconscious. And before she knows it, she's just not even in that argument anymore. She has checked out, or she may be in the argument, but she's also checked out. So she's not even aware of what she's saying or what she's doing. Mm -hmm. There's like a defensive reaction to whatever's happening. Yeah. And I think that this is also where we have more of the disorganized responses where a person can check out, but then they can also lash out. And then they can say or do things in that moment that later on they don't remember Mm -hmm. because they were checked out. The amygdala had also checked out, but they were also lashing out. They were also fighting. They were also defending themselves. And in that moment, things were said or done that were damaging or extreme, but they don't have a memory of it. Yeah. So there's a a defensive response to what's happening, but if this makes sense, they have distance from what's actually going on. Yes. So this defense comes in and takes over where, and that person might not be fully aware of what's going on. So going back to what we were trying to explore, where how can you tell if this reaction is dissociation or is it just overwhelm and extreme stress? And I think it's one of those things where you have to look at these experiences in retrospect and you're able to identify that if in my relationship I feel like I'm not being heard or considered, that is actually something that my amygdala can perceive as very dangerous. And so being aware of this can help an individual because they can now have a conversation with their significant other so that their partner knows. They can also begin to prepare themselves for when they might have a difficult conversation with their partner. They might put some structure around conversations that might be very intense or involve some disagreement. Even things like if we're going to discuss something that could be very upsetting or result in a lot of intense emotions, let's schedule that so that the individual can prepare, ground themselves, practice affirmations that, you know, this conversation, I'm safe. I'm discussing plans with my husband about vacation you know, with my family. And even though we might disagree or there might be stress or frustration, I'm safe that my partner is listening to me. And so that type of preparation for possible experiences that might result in dissociation. So that's, I think that's one of the ways that I work with my clients is trying to identify these after the fact often, because it's unfortunately sometimes the only way you can really understand what happened. And then beginning to prepare for when these might happen so that they can go into that from a different state, a different space. Yeah. So what situations or circumstances bring up this reaction in you? And like you were saying, seeing things in hindsight, it's paying attention to, was I present when that situation was happening? Because you can be stressed and anxious and stay present versus was I connected to my body? Was I aware of what was happening around me? Was I present in that moment? Do I remember that conversation or how that played out? And sometimes those looking back on things can give us clues. And then in looking at that, what was going on? If I did disconnect, what was happening right before that brought that on? Maybe for HSP comes to mind for this kind of circumstance, like going into the grocery store. And maybe there's, the lights are really bright and they're playing loud music. Maybe it's really crowded that day. 
And that person starts to feel very overwhelmed. And maybe checking out is one of their ways of coping. They developed that way because they didn't learn other tools. And so they get through the grocery store and maybe it's a little foggy because they disconnected. So what, you know, what was it about being in the grocery store and pinpointing these things that I said at the beginning of like, oh, well, the lights were really bright and the music was loud. There's lots of people there. I got really overstimulated. What could I do next time I go into the grocery store? Maybe I wear a hat to make the lights not feel so bright and I can wear my headphones or, you know, these different things. Go during a time that maybe isn't as crowded. Yeah. So finding ways to adapt to that. And if it was maybe more of a trauma response, you know, thinking back of what was the thing that activated me? oh, I didn't feel, something about that situation didn't feel safe. Okay, what was it? Oh, it was really dark or, you know, some kind of information that reminded me of the, these past experiences, how you were referencing not feeling heard. Yeah. You know, and I think too that, you know, we're, this is now also why working with a therapist who is knowledgeable and skilled and trained and working with trauma is absolutely necessary for working through dissociation and really understanding why it happens and making those changes. And so, you know, just want to emphasize that, that this is a normal response that happens sometimes when we are traumatized and it is just our brain's very efficient and effective way of keeping us safe in that moment. And we just continue to do this over time and just get really good at it. But it's also something that you can recover from and there is a way through that. Yeah, so although it, it, it is a normal adaptive response to be protective and to create these defenses for oneself, it also can, be, can cause problems for people, difficulties in relationships or it can feel sometimes a little bit scary for some people to be like, I don't remember that. Or like you were saying, sometimes they hurt themselves without remembering that. And I'd imagine a lot of people don't necessarily want to be doing this, although it is adaptive, they probably would like to find other ways to deal with difficult emotions or to be able to stay present. You know, and I just want to add, Carmen, to what you were saying, that dissociation is a feeling of not being in control and not knowing what's going on. And that is very, you know, anxiety inducing for those who experience it. And they do want to be able to respond to, you know, their day-to-day interactions in a different way. And from a place where their cortex, their thinking center is present, that their ability to connect and to feel is present. And learning how do I do this and stay with what's uncomfortable and distressing without my brain perceiving that it's danger. And so I think this is a good place for us to segue into some of the ways that individuals can cope or respond to dissociation. Yeah, I think coping tools are so important because that's why oftentimes people do dissociate, right? If they don't have the tools, they have no other alternatives for managing whatever is going on. And so one thing I'll say is that it can be really helpful to work with a therapist to help find coping strategies. And there are ways that you can find things on your own to work to stay present, at least as a starting point. But if it is something that you really would like to work on. The root of where that's coming from, working with a therapist can be really important. But in terms of staying present, one thing I encourage is just engaging with your environment. So being mindful and maybe go outside, put your feet on the ground, really notice how the ground feels beneath your feet. If you can't go outside, you know, just sitting in your chair, I feel, you know, the seat beneath me. I feel my feet on the ground or in my shoes and connect with that. One strategy that I teach a lot of clients and many find very helpful, it sounds really simple, but it really gets you focused on the here and now, which is what's so important about getting present. And I call it 54321. It's often called that. Sometimes there's other names for it. 
And then the numbers really don't matter. The order doesn't really matter, but it's just an easier way to remember it. So that's naming five things that you see. So you just say out loud or in your head, the things that you see in the room or wherever you are, four things that you feel like tactilely with sense of touch and three things that you hear, two things that you smell and one thing that you taste. So you're engaging all of your senses to connect with your body and connect with the environment around you to be, get really present. Another strategy to connect with your body is a progressive muscle relaxation. And that is where you tense a group of muscles and then release them. So you breathe in, tensing up the muscles, and then release when you breathe out. And really paying attention to the sensation of when your muscles are relaxed. Because if you just rush through it without noticing, you're not really staying connected with your body. One thing I should say about that is that some people might want to be cautious with anything related to connecting more with their body if they have trouble feeling safe in their body, because sometimes people have had traumatic experiences where they actually don't feel very safe in their body. So connecting with the body can feel really activating for them. And so I just like to name that. And that also, if that's going on, then it's maybe especially important to work with a therapist to help manage that. So you could get to a place where you feel like you can connect with your body. And then just as we were mentioning before of, I just want to reiterate, being proactive about starting to pay attention to and become aware of the situations and circumstances that you notice this is happening. When, where, who, what are the triggers for you? Because the more awareness you have, the better you can do something about it. We can't change something or do something unless we're aware of it. And so then when you're proactive and you have awareness of what those situations are, sometimes it's unpredictable. We don't know when they're going to come up. But if you do know you're going into a situation that can bring this up for you, at least you can try to do some of these things to stay grounded and present going into it. And like as you're having the conversation, paying attention to your breathing, doing that five, four, three, two, one, staying connected so that it's less likely that you will start to to distance yourself from what's going on. And, you know, you referenced earlier, Lourdes, of is this like stress or is this dissociation? And so another thing I would add is paying attention because finding distraction, like sometimes when we zone out on TV or get into a book, sometimes that can be really helpful to distract for a little while to regulate our nervous system because it's really activated or we're overwhelmed. But there can be a fine line sometimes between self-care and avoidance. And so just asking yourself, am I avoiding or am I taking care of myself here? Do I need a little break or am I just avoiding dealing with my feelings? So I just wanted to add that in to make that distinction because there can be times that it is Again, it's adaptive, so it can be really helpful. That's why it occurs. But sometimes it can be to the point where it is avoidance. And we want to be able to determine what's going on there. I just want to add, especially for highly sensitive persons, the importance of really knowing what this trait is and how it affects you. because. I know in my work with clients, you know, when they're able to discern that, okay, this is the trait, this is my trauma, and this is normal stress, then you know that you're really developing the skills to give your body, your mind, your emotions, whatever response they need. And so I think, especially for HSPs, understanding how you can become overstimulated and the intense emotions understanding how this gift of empathy can also turn into absorbing everybody's feelings around you, including the ones that aren't comfortable, noticing the subtleties, all of these beautiful qualities of being highly sensitive. But can these qualities can also, if you're not structuring your day or your life with the trait in mind, that can actually lead to situations where you might 
find yourself shutting down or shutting out or disconnecting. And it may have to do with the trait versus the trauma versus normal stress. And so it takes some time, some effort, some attention to wade through all of these and discern what is what and when it's happening. And is this a little bit of both? But it's definitely worth your while. And it's something that you can do to some extent on your own. If you have gone through trauma, you can do this with the support of a therapist as well. I'm so glad you said that. I think that is so important for HSPs that have trauma to be able to distinguish, is this a trauma reaction or am I overwhelmed or overstimulated or am I just stressed out? (laughs) Um, Because each of those things, you're going to have different needs around them. So applying some of the tools that you know that help with one thing might not be effective with the other thing. Like if it's a trauma response, but you think that you're overstimulated or overwhelmed, then the tools that you use for overwhelm and overstimulation might not be as effective for the trauma reaction and vice versa, yeah. right? So making, and it, it goes back to that piece of awareness, right? Learning more about yourself because each person is going to be different in what they need and how that shows up in their life. So thank you so much for joining us today as we discuss dissociation. We appreciate you listening and We are going to be going on a little bit of a summer hiatus while we work on some other projects and plan our topics for the fall. So thank you for listening. We will include everything that we referenced in the show notes. And if you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to reach out to me or Carmen and our contact information is also in the show notes. And we will see you in the fall. Have a wonderful summer. Thanks so much for listening to the Women in Depth podcast. I hope it brings you a deeper understanding of yourself and others, and that you found some insights that illuminated and inspired. If you like what you hear, please consider supporting Women in Depth with a one-time or recurring donation. Any amount is appreciated and helps us continue to provide free, quality content for the world. If donating resonates with you, you can find the donation link on today's show notes. You can also follow Women in Depth on Facebook and YouTube. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe on iTunes. Again, thank you so much for listening and see you next time.